Hello. Today we've got Rasmus, who started the Pemican project in the summer of 2024. Can you tell us a bit more about you, Rasmus, please? Yeah, absolutely. So, yes, I'm Rasmus. I'm founder of the Pemmican Project. It was an idea I'd had for probably a few years, um, but then didn't really start to do anything about it until last year and then, oh, sorry, this year, this summer. And then all of a sudden it's, uh, it's taking off quite fast. So, uh, very exciting. Great. So, you're linked to the carnivore community, and I believe you are doing the carnivore diet. What or who inspired you to try this, uh, this diet? And lifestyle, Ooh. because it's just yeah, so, a, it's a lot more than a diet. It's actually a lifestyle. Oh, exactly. That, that's also how I think about it. So I think the very first point of origin, so to speak, was Michaela Peterson. i um, been a big Jordan Peterson fan for years. Uh, and then when I came across her and the lion diet, I was like, well, this sounds interesting. Um, I was very classic, healthy, let's call it that, like bodybuilding, chicken and rice, meal planning, all these things. So at first, of course, I thought it sounded completely insane. But then when I started looking into it, I think the real kicker was then finding Anthony Chafee, who I thought, well, first of all, this guy's jacked, so he looks like he knows what he's talking about. Uh, and second of all, um, the way he talked about it, it just made sense, like on a commonsensical way. So I thought, well, why not, uh, why not try? So you were completely healthy, uh, doing everything like we had been kind of told to do. And mm -hmm. then you discovered someone who had a different view of what should be healthy and you de decided to give it a try. Uh, you mentioned Michaela Patterson. So did you go... First, the lion diet, which is a bit of the extreme part of the carnivore diet, like she recommends or advocates, I should say. Hmm. Or did you do a more varied carnivore diet to start with? I think this wasn't even because I was choosing between lion diet or carnivore diet. It was just for my own simplicity of like, well, if I'm going to give it a go, I'll, I just want to make it as easy for myself as possible. So I just ate only ribeye for, I did like a two week experiment, ribeye, and then maybe occasionally like eggs and bacon in the morning. That, that was it. But it, it was more just from a, I do like cooking. I just don't like spending too much time cooking. Um, so this was just the easiest for me. So that's how, that's how I dive into it. Now, well, I was about to say it's different, but to be honest, it's still very similar. There's a few other areas where I step out or whatever you want to call it. But generally, the things I eat are exactly the same thing. Eggs and bacon and steak. Mm, great. And so you said the, your first experiment was two weeks. How different did you feel after two weeks? Because obviously you decided to keep going. So there must have been like a change to your already pretty healthy diet. Oh, yeah. So that, that, that was the kicker for me to then be like, okay, this is the only thing I'm going to eat because I already felt quite good and I was already in pretty good shape at that time and yes I did eat like the eggs chicken and rice avocado super fruit I was doing all these super smoothies that you're supposed to do um and it's not I did enjoy it like I was I was perfectly happy with that diet um part of the appeal of the carnivore diet was of course like is, is someone giving me permission to only eat steak eggs and bacon because that sounds pretty great uh, so I did that I actually didn't really experience any of the, I've heard people sometimes talk about carnivore flu or getting into mm -hmm. carnivore, take some adjustment. I'd like to say that within the first 48 hours, I think it was, I started feeling just like everything got dialed up to 200%, which I just did not expect. Like I felt amazing. Energy levels was higher. I didn't get fatigue or brain fog or anything like that. Uh, yeah. So, so that was really it. My workouts were better. So I guess recovery was better as well. Recovery was better. Just everything felt better. I felt like I slept better. I just my general well being was better. Um, I started thinking like, well, I thought I felt great before. How do I feel mm. so great now? And then the real contrast was, of course, when I'd done it for a couple of weeks. If I then tried to add some stuff back in, not well, okay, not add some stuff back in. If I decided to have a cheat meal and be like, okay, pancake time, mm. then I would feel the contrast. Uh, like, okay, there's definitely something to this. Okay, so how am I? Has it been now? That must have been in 2019, so about five years now. Wow, amazing. Yeah, it's been a so, while. Any tip for anyone who would like to give the carnivore diet a try? Um, because you probably inspired a lot of uh, friends or colleagues. I think the carnivore diet, although it's becoming a bit mainstream, is still a, an oddity because we don't have mm. the fiber days and the fibers and all the things that the... Um, the media is telling us are super healthy. What tip do you usually de give to people who are curious or eager to give it a try, but not sure mm. where to start with? Yeah, I think there's the conversation usually goes in one or two ways. One is the concerns about the benefits of it and this whole discussion that it's almost as if 
they want to know about this before even diving in. Um, and usually my advice is just, of course, you should do your own research. But for me, the real proof was always the uh, try it and then see how you feel within two weeks. Because it, I, I feel like it's very hard to argue with how your body feels. And if you can feel this great, it seems very strange that it would be bad for you. Um, so that that's like the proof number one and just the give it a shot. But then in terms of how to do it, I would also say just keep it super simple. Like stick to foods that you know you already eat. Don't worry about, I know there's also a lot of chat about organs and liver and all these things. Um, I wouldn't worry about that at all. Uh, I'll just stick to foods that you know that you already like, whether that's eggs and bacon or scrambled eggs or beef mince and eggs or steak. I mean, in my case, ribeye was something or probably my favorite food. So I figured I'm just only going to eat that. I'd say that's the easiest way to get started um, would be those two things. Like just see how you feel and then keep it as simple as possible. And did you have anyone come back to you and say, you know, they have the keto flu or the flu, let's call it the flu, or any digestive issues within the first two weeks? Because that's usually when, you know, the constipation yeah. and the gut thing is happening. Um, mm -hmm. So what did you tell them? So no, I did give them a heads up about it that, look, some mm. people report these things. Uh, no one came back with saying they had keto flu-like symptoms. Some oh, did cool. come back saying... Uh, digestive system was a little bit confused for the first couple of days or something. Um, but then that goes away. But all of them came back reporting that they just felt absolutely incredible. Yeah. 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 I, I, I agree. But uh, I have to say, if I had tried only two weeks, I would have probably given up. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's why I'm asking you and I'm curious about your phone and so, but uh, because I think Personally, two weeks was probably not enough, but more like mm. a month. But yeah, no, that's great. So now you, you've got your tribe of, um, your carnivore tribe around you and it's easier well, to do things. I, I feel like my, my carnivore tribe is still very much an online tribe. Like even the friends that tried out, I think the, the challenge for them is maintaining it. Uh, they really mm. like being on it, but then it's um, things about the regular diet that they miss. So they don't want to do it 100%, which by the way, I also think is fine. I think, uh, mm. I don't think you're only, I don't, go, I don't think it has to be 100 or zero. Like there's no doubt that 100% is most beneficial, but mm. I would just like to push everyone towards a more animal-based diet. If that means they still want to, I don't know, a lot of my friends are Italian, I pass this sometimes, like it's fine, so be it. Uh, would it be better if you didn't? Maybe, uh, probably. But again, as long as they're moving towards that direction, like less sugars, more animal-based, then, then I'm happy. Yeah, I think it's a continuum and the carnivore community is very tolerant to where you are. And as long as you're meat-based, I think everyone is accepting and, and understand mm. that it's just everyone is different and has different needs. So, so that's great. So now let's come to the Pemmican project, Yes, which is a meat product. Can you tell us what inspired you to, to start this project? Because before you and your bar that I tried, I've never actually heard from that. No. So um, I came across it pretty early in getting into carnivore because like in, in very typical me fashion, I find someone thing I'm excited about and then I just start reading everything about it. Um, and then I came across Pemmican and I thought, this sounds really, really cool and it's very convenient. But then I didn't really give too many thoughts about it. Then a couple of years later, um, I start traveling a lot and that really messed up my eating schedule, mostly because it was just hard for me to find like good options either at airports or at hotels late at night, all these things. So I started making it uh, just to like try it out. And then A, I really liked it, uh, despite it being a bit of an effort to make. But B, it just, it helped me out so much with traveling uh, because the fact that I could just now have a snack that I brought everywhere was just super useful. Um, and that, so it was, I was kind of doing that on and off. Um, and then I got the idea sometime last year that this seems like a product that should be out there. Like, I don't understand why it isn't. Um, but then I parked it for a number of other reasons. But then it was this summer where I was on holiday and I was like, well, why not just see if I can give it a shot and like try and make something out of this? So I, I posted a giveaway and then I didn't think anyone was going to sign up. Then a bunch of people sign up. And I was like, okay, well, no one's going to like it. And then I send them the product. And then everyone comes back and says they really like it. And then it's just kind of kept moving from there. Mm. Can you tell us about what, what it is for those who don't know mm. and where it originates, if there is like a country or a place and yeah, yeah these kind of things, because uh, obviously um, I did a bit of research. I was interested, I did a bit of research, but you, you're the founder, so you're the best person to explain us what it is. 
Yeah, well, uh, uh, let's see about that. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not a history buff, so I'm going to get some of the finer points wrong. But from what I understand, we don't really know the exact origin of pemmican, but it's generally attributed to uh, Native American tribes. And basically, Ooh. the story was, is that it's a predominantly hunter-gatherer nomadic uh, tribe tribes. So if you live primarily off of hunting large bison, and then all of a sudden winter hits, which is several months of very little hunting, and how exactly do you preserve your food? This was basically how they did it, um, which is basically a way of you have this giant beast now that weighs, what, several hundred pounds. So technically, that could feed one person for an entire year. But you need a way to preserve all of that. Uh, so what they would do is, well, you butcher the animal, take the meats, separate it from the fats, the meat you then dry out completely, as in completely dried out, no mushiness in the middle, then pulverize it to a fine powder. And then the fat you render, so you get rid of all the excess water and moisture and uh, uh, tidbits. <clears throat> and then you mix it back together and shape into these little balls at the time. I now make bars just because it's easier to package. But then that's yeah. really, it becomes this really high calorie, uh, high nutrient bar that then later got picked up by explorers and people who went to the Antarctica and like it, it got picked up in Europe uh, because it did make for a very good survival food. Okay. And, uh, and you found out about the recipe and you decided to give it a try. Yeah, exactly. They do also sometimes put berries in it, which I haven't dabbled in yet. Might do mm -hmm. at some point. Yeah. So that's how you got inspired. And so what do you think are the primary health benefits of consuming the pemmican? So I think it's very similar to or similar to a carnivore diet, except I do still think uh, optimally would be fresh steak and like fresh mm -hmm. food always. Um, again, it's not that it's not fresh. It's just it's the equivalent of uh, cooking your steak to complete beyond well done, which I would obviously never do. But if you can't do that, if you can't bring a steak in your carry on, which I can't at least, then it's, it just makes for a super good uh, backup, which is how I use it. I wouldn't, well, I would at some point try to just for experiment's sake, eat only pemmican. And I have accidentally done so uh, in periods of time simply because, well, I make so much of it now that it's always lying mm -hmm. around. And so when mm -hmm. I have a busy day, I'll just go and I'll peck on this throughout the day. Uh, and then all of a sudden it's evening and I realize I haven't eaten anything but pemmican, um, which is fine. Like I feel great, mm. but I would say health benefits are just, I consider it the same as on carnivore, except if you only ate pemmican a little less so. So I use it more as a, like a maintenance backup, uh, hiking yeah, meal yeah, bar. Like a meal replacement bar. <clears throat> exactly. Yeah, yeah. But the, for, for the carnivore. The yes, carnivore exactly. Meal replacement bar. Carnivore okay, meal great. replacement. And I understand you actually prepare everything yourself still. Mm -hmm. How do you source the ingredients? Because uh, you mentioned the bison, but I guess it's you're, you're based in London, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yes. So it, it must be really hard to get bison. So you're, yes. you're doing beef, if I understand well. Yeah, so of course, that, that's maybe an important thing to add. So the origin was bison, but it can be made with... I'm not going to say every meat source, but many different meat sources. It has been made with uh, both beef and game, and I believe some also have made it with pork, which I've yet to try out. So there's many different ways of uh, making it. But the basic premise is the same, that it's like a meat that gets completely stripped of fat uh, powder and then mixed that in, back in with the fat. Um, so I make it entirely from beef. I'll mm -hmm. try different variations at some point. But as you said, I'm making everything from start to finish myself right now. So for simplicity, I'm just sticking to one product, one recipe, one version, and, and that's what I've been making. In terms of sourcing it, I mean, when I first wanted to try it out, obviously I just made more of what I was already making, which was mm -hmm. go to m &S, go to Tesco, get my uh, lean beef, and then fat would be uh, butchers often because uh, you can get your hands on excess tallow. Um, mm -hmm. Started trying different varieties of tallow online just because it lets me buy in bigger bulk and like it was mm -hmm. a little irregular how often I could get it from the butchers. And it's it's somewhat the same now. Some of the things are more standardized, like all the tallow I get from uh, a butcher. Um, the beef, still trying to figure out what's what's going to be the best source. Obviously, retail is not going to be uh, the answer long term. At some point, that's also going to be um, some sort of B2B buying. But that for now, it still is uh, just retail beef, but the grass fed variety. You tried um, uh, the meat market in London, Smithfield Markets. I've heard about it, and it's actually on my list of things that I need to uh, to go and check out. It's 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 pretty good. That's where I get yeah. I get my meat from. Yeah. 
So, but long term, something I did come across at um, Carnival Conference a few weeks ago was yeah. a Pasture for Life, which I was embarrassed to never have heard about. Um, yeah. So, tell me about it. <laughs> things like, well, so Pasture for Life, I'm probably going to butcher it now. So, Pasture for Life, if you're listening, then please correct me. But basically, is grass fed is what we all want. But mm -hmm. apparently, when you go to the supermarket, grass fed cannot always be trusted to mean actually fully grass fed. But what Pasture for Life is, as far as I understand, is a group of farmers who everything is completely grass fed. Like the animals live outside. I don't know if they live outside 24 seven. I don't, I'm not a farmer, mm. but they, they are a hundred percent grass fed and what we would understand to be a hundred percent grass fed. And that's the sort of agriculture I would like to support. So for me, a goal would also be that at some point, um, all of my product is sourced from farmers, whether it's pasture for life or similar, but ones where I know that it is a hundred percent grass fed. It's amazing. Yeah. I'm, uh, I've never heard of Pasture for Life, but it's it's a great concept. I'm not sure. Exactly. So it, it, it's possible to get in the UK because in winter, I would assume there is no grass. It's just like not frozen or on the <laughs> snow, but it's just like, well, I, I don't know. I'm sure you, you do your research and you, and you find what what's the best. So you explain how pemmican is typically done. So I understand you buy the, the meats, so the mussels, and then you buy the tallow, the fat. Mm -hmm. do, do, um, do you mind explaining how, how it works in your kitchen or is it still a secret recipe? That no, no, uh, that, that's totally yeah. fine. So, so I have a bunch of dryers that pretty much work in uh, two or three eight hour shifts. Uh, so I just get, I get all the beef, I put it into the dryers, which of course just means, you know, separating it, slicing it, spreading it out so it can dry nicely. And then I put mm -hmm. it into the dryer and it goes in there for about eight hours, depending on what sort of cut it, cut it is. But I'm trying to make it all mince because that seems to dry the easiest. So that sits there and dries. Um, so I fill up a good stock of basically just completely dried beef. And then a couple of times a week, um, I, of course, right now just buy tallow. So that's basically rendered fat. So I don't need to render it. At some point, I'd probably like to just buy fat, and make my own tallow. But that's a separate story. So yeah. I just it's use the tallow. That takes a while, exactly. Um, yeah, I've done it since the, like it, it's a bit time. of an effort. I'd like to do it, but again, at some point when I have few, have more time, then uh, then I'll definitely do that as well. But so so I dry the whole thing, and then the actual mixing process is fairly simple. It's just okay. So heat up the tallow. It needs to be a pretty not super accurate temperature, but if it's too hot, it separates. If it's too cold, obviously you can't mix it. Mm. Um, but then heat it up, mix it together, and then I just shape all these bars out um, that I then keep in the fridge. Not that they need to, but it's just when I keep put them in the fridge, they firm up faster and then it's easier to um, to package them quickly because, of course, I don't have a giant warehouse right now, so I can't keep very large stocks of inventory. Uh, so I need to very much um, dry it, produce it, package it in a relatively seamless fashion. Like I can store a lot of bars. I can't store a lot of uh, raw pemmican mm, for now. Yeah. I understand. So you're, you're mentioning the bars. How long, what's the expiry date? Because I understand, you know, because it's just meat and fat and there's no uh, mm -hmm. nothing. It's supposed to have a very long um, expiry date. Yes. So technically, pemmican has been reported to last up to decades if it's stored in an uh, airtight container. Which uh, it is and... because your, your sachet is, is completely... Uh, earth. Exactly. So my mine is completely airtight. Now for... Safety reasons, again, because I'm, of course, I'm very mindful of the fact that I've started a food mm. business and there's a lot of regulations to it. And I haven't done any laboratory tests of my product yet, obviously. Uh, so for safety reasons, I've just put one year shelf life as long as it's in the actual pouch, which is perfectly safe. Um, at some point, I do want to get laboratory tests done on the product so I can actually put it will last 20 years. That would be pretty great to be able to put on the package. Mm. But for safety reasons right now, I'm just putting it at a year. Um, mine lasts about two weeks because I eat it anyway. So yeah, but it can, it will stay safe for a long time. Do you have one next to you to show yeah, for uh, sure. the people what it looks like? So package product looks like this. Mm -hmm. The actual product right now looks like this, which is, and, uh, I mean, it's been called all, all sorts of things that I'm not going to say on the podcast. Um, yeah. But uh, besides the very homemade look, then uh, it does taste quite good in my opinion. Yeah, it does. So can you tell us about how much it weighs and, and the nutrition, like calories and um, nutrition as in, yeah, calorie macros and, and yeah, things, sure. if, you, if you have them? Yeah, yeah. so the, the bars right now, I've just settled on 50 grams. This was a combo of 
just asking my audience what seems to be the sweet spot size and 50 grams uh, coincides with about 300, 330 calories technically. But that makes it quite easy for calorie planning for people that want to do that. Like I personally don't count calories, but I understand that especially people who might be new to an animal-based diet, they want to have something easy to plan. I'll probably want to increase the bar size over time, but just for uh, silly blocker is just things like, well, the molds that I make the bars in right now now happen to be 50 grams. So of course it's a little more than just adding extra, but at some point I want that to be bigger. Then in terms of macros, um, 70% of the calories comes from fat and then the remaining comes from um, protein because obviously fat has such a high calorie content that the majority of the energy comes from the fat itself. So it is about 19 grams of protein and 19 grams of fat in the bar. It's a one-to-one -one ratio. Yeah. Great. And for those who have not fully transitioned to the carnivore diet and may not be used to the fat, the taste of the oh, fat. Oh, I'm sorry. I, was, I, I overspoke. It's slightly more fat. It's 29 grams of fat to about uh, okay. 18 grams of protein. I'm sorry. But when you mix it, it's one-to-one -one beef, beef and fat. Yeah, well, it's pretty much the same, 19, yeah, yeah. 18 to 20. So let's not, uh, yeah. So, so I just say for those who haven't transitioned fully to the carnivore diet and may not be used to the high fat content, but are still curious to try about it, mm -hmm. is there something you, you would recommend how to, uh, yeah, to try it for the first time? Yeah, so I haven't found a good protocol for this yet because this is a key piece of feedback I've gotten a lot that people who already are on a carnivore diet, and I believe it's probably because they're already quite fat adapted, they tend to really like pemmican right out of the gate. Um, whereas when I've given it to friends or others who are not so much uh, on a full on carnivore diet, the reviews are very mixed. Some outright don't like it, some are just very surprised by like the taste and consistency of it, um, that it's not a it's not a super thrilling experience is what they report back, which is completely fine. Uh, I was, of course, surprised about in the beginning because I've liked it since uh, day one. But I also like I've always been fairly uh, carnivore adapted. So whether there's a good way of um, getting into it, the best piece of feedback I've gotten so far on it is simply people who tried it were like, OK, if they weren't thrilled right away, they would just wait, honestly couple of days or maybe even just a couple hours try it again because they just needed to get past the i guess surprising taste and consistency because when you look at it and you're used to what a normal say protein bar tastes like this is not what it tastes like uh like normal proteins bars will probably fall more into the sorry protein bars candy category in terms of taste mm. but this is very much not that yeah i agree i i think i haven't shared with you my first experience of a pemmican oh, bar do. but <laughs> when when i opened it i was a bit surprised because it didn't look like anything but at the same time what do you expect i kind of expected like a protein bar but i knew mm -hmm. it was different so i'm like okay fine but you know meat is never good to to picture to photograph you know when i take pictures of my meal it always look like yeah. and it tastes delicious so i'm like okay fine let's forget about it and then my first bite was surprising and i was i i thought it was a bit too much fat for me because although i eat a lot of meat sometimes when i eat too much fat for i tend to have like a digestive issues so i had like one bite and i stopped and it was fine and then i left it in the fridge and i just like I was eating it bite by bite, and I think now I like it. Mm. Uh, and I would probably use it like when I travel to make sure that I have something I can rely on. But I like to cook my meals. So for me, it wouldn't be a meal replacement. But that's no. definitely something I, I, I would recommend because I don't think there is any other product in the market in Europe that I'm aware of that could uh, that could replace a meal or be as good as that with really good ingredients and no mm. no extra that like you know don't need to be there but yeah so that's why I'm, I was curious but uh, yeah no it's it's a good one it's uh, I'm super it's glad you like it definitely something I I'm, I would recommend and that's why I'm super pleased that you know you accepted to be here today because for me I, it's it's the future you know as many entrepreneur willing to spread the world about the carnivore lifestyle that that that's perfect and have you faced any challenges in promoting this more traditional foods because obviously meat has been around for like always mm -hmm. but pushing for the carnivore lifestyle is, is something that is uh, i mean I, I don't know about you but i got some nasty messages on social media so i was wondering you know how do you how is it for you so uh, actually not, I would say. I think part of it was that I started this whole thing with extremely low expectations. And then obviously the 
the, the people that it resonated with the first was, of course, the carnival community, which I actually find to be an extremely supportive community. So yeah. I would say my my immediate impression is and it's always been for these past couple of months that uh, I'm completely overwhelmed by the amount of positive reactions I get, which is fantastic. Like that's really also been motivating for me to uh, to keep pushing forward on it. I say the only type of negative comments I get is related to price, which is still completely fair um, because, of course, the the goal of the whole thing, yeah, because the the reason I started it, there's many reasons I started it, but one of the key ones is that I do want to bring down the cost of animal-based product. Well, the cost and the availability. In without mm. going into it in too much detail, I think the two biggest blockers for an animal-based diet to become more mainstream and take off is um, it's not easy to have very in a very affordable manner, um, and it's just also not very available. Like if you go into a supermarket or a grocery store and you want an animal-based snack. It's very hard, but there's a million options for uh, sugar and cookies and all these things. So my goal was really, I want it to be available everywhere and I want to run down the cost. But of course, animal-based products, uh, the source products are more expensive than whatever mm. goes into a granola bar. So if you just compare it to a granola bar and then you look at a pemmican bar, it's going to look very expensive. Obviously, I'd love if I could one day produce it at a cost similar to a granola bar. Uh, but then it's going to be a few more people than just myself making it to get to that point. But that is the goal. Um, so I actually, I don't take offense to those comments. Um, I also try and structure it in a way that if you don't know if you like it, I'll just send you some stuff for free. And then mm -hmm. if you know that you do like it, it's of course also easier for me to produce a lot than it is to produce a small batch. So people are okay buying uh, in big bulks. Then I can also make it significantly cheaper. So those are the only negative comments I've gotten. Um, and that's, that doesn't really face me. That's fine. Yeah, but I mean, people know that um, meats cost so much more than cereals. It's just yes. like, it's just common sense. I mean, this community yeah. knows that. It's just like, uh, and there is a lot of work to do as well. It's not just like um, slicing the meat. It's just like dehydrating yeah. and mixing. And you've just ex explained that. So, okay, well, that's good. You know, I guess once you find your suppliers and perhaps you get a team on board. I mean, I, I don't mm -hmm. know how you see, well, actually, what's your vision for, for the Pemican project? Is it just a project or, or, or are you going to develop it more like a, a product that you want to keep going and, and growing? So it's, um, for me personally, it's way more than just a project. I did call it project because I see it as like my ultimate project. Um, okay. Without going too much into like uh, everything else I've done for work. So very briefly, I've worked in software sales for many years. And as much as I love doing that, it's not like I derive a whole lot of meaning from selling software. Um, and then I thought, well, if I was going to work on something that I really think is meaningful, it would probably be something like, can I help everyone, honestly, uh, to become more healthy? Mm -hmm. And this just seemed like such an obvious thing where I'm like, this has helped me so much. It helped a lot of people that I know, if not at least familiar with online, uh, that this just seems like something that should be there. Uh, so the way I think about it right now is that I have a lot of milestones that go out decades to be honest in terms of where i want this to go and the first one is of course uh, i need to get to the point where i do this full time because right now the most limited resource is just the how much time i put into it from there i want to be wanted to be self-sufficient within the uk in terms of production and facilities and these things because if i want to open up in other markets which is definitely the goal then I also want, then I'll obviously need production in those other markets. So there's, there's a very long-term plan of where I wanted to get to. Same for, and of, that of course branches out into when I can produce more. I'd also like to have more variations, like maybe I'll do one with game meat, one with berries. Like th these are more like the fun little variations I'd like to do. But in terms of the big milestones, it is the, I really would like to scale it to the point where it impacts not just the availability and price of animal-based products, but also things like, uh, how much is sourced from good agriculture is something I really do mm. want to uh, to impact at some point. And then probably most importantly, it's not even a side project. The part of the part of it I'm most passionate about is there's two groups I'd really like to help with this uh, because those are the ones that I think are most important. Is anyone with uh, an autoimmune disease or any illness really that's impacted by carnivore? Yeah. The amount of positive response I've gotten from people with one condition or another is absolutely incredible uh, and I'm very happy to be able to help those uh, which is why when I'm able to drive down price they're the ones that are impacted first so already now they buy at a significant discount and then the other group which is going to be harder to crack is uh, kids I think 
when I think about what I ate as a kid, I'm pretty sure I ate Choco Pops for the first 15 years of my life, um, which is just a travesty. One, I didn't know any better, but two, the options just wouldn't have been there. Like I wouldn't have been able to eat uh, eggs and bacon in school for lunch and all these things. So step one for that would obviously be that if someone wants to package for the kids, then that's cheaper as well. Ultimately, what I would love to do is that I can produce this at a scale that makes it uh, economical for schools to buy this instead of whatever goes for lunch in schools right now. Because I don't think schools are going to have healthier options until it's actually economical for them to do so or sufficiently economical for them to do so. Wow, that's amazing plans. Um... Thank you. <laughs> thank but, you yeah no i mean i so um yeah i mean basically um i have hashimoto's and that's why i was willing to give the uh, carnivore diet to try and i i felt the difference almost immediately and as for children i'm just like if you manage to do that that would be amazing i mean i've got a son he's nine and he eats a lot of meat because he understands he's really mm -hmm. tall because he eats you know what he's supposed to eat but when I look at the school lunches, it's just horrible. It, mm. It's just like just carbs and, and the children, they're hungry. They don't even eat to satiety. So that would be amazing if you, if you, or when, I should say when, you know, I yes, think everything is possible. <laughs> so when there's a, a mindset shift in, uh, in the government uh, guidelines and, and stuff, but yeah, prices is, is definitely uh, one of the issues. So you've mentioned your, your plans. Uh, so you, are you going to stick to one one product for for what for the year? Because you mentioned maybe you can add berries and stuff. So I'm like, oh my god, that's uh, exciting! Not that it brings sugar to the thing, but it's just mm. like I, I don't know. Yeah, I think um, if you want to be, of course, 100 percent no sugar, all these things, which I think is generally a good approach. Then obviously you don't want one with berries. I do think adding mm. a little bit of dried berries, for me personally, uh, I think it's fine. Um, of course, there's also the element of I also need to make a product that is not just economical for schools, but kids also need to actually like eating it. And I haven't yes. sampled the product with that many kids yet. Um, so whether oh. that's going to be a variety maybe with more honey in it, or I don't know. Um, so that that's a separate one. But there's definitely plenty of variations I'd love to try out. Like I'd love to try out different types of game. I'd love to try out different type, kinds of tallow. I'd love to experiment with different mm. kinds of berries. Like there's a lot of variations I think could be could be fun to make. But again, right now, the primary bottleneck is just how much time I have to put into it. And as soon as I make a separate variation that it doesn't exactly double the effort, but but almost because now I need to make two mm. different ones and you have two different sorts of packaging, two different variations of um, shipping and all these things. So for until I have probably a slightly bigger facility with uh, with people helping, then it's probably just going to stay at the one variation. Okay, and it's a great one, I want Thank to you. add. <laughs> so we are coming towards the end. Is there anything that we haven't discussed or mentioned that you would like to add now? Because um, you've kindly answered all my questions, but I'm sure there is a lot more that needs to be said. And, and yeah, if you, there is anything you want to add, I feel free to do it now. Anything I want to add? Um, I think only thing would be that what really helps right now and has helped a lot is uh, even if people aren't necessarily super interested in eating pemmican, helping get the word out helps uh, a lot. I've been very flattered by how many people have shared my content. Uh, if they've tried it out, they shared their experience, or even if they haven't, that they just support the project. It really helps a lot because it gets more, it gets more eyes on what it is that this is all about. Um, so if people do want to support, of course, I'm primarily on Instagram because... I'm not that social media savvy, so I figured I'm just going to try and see if I can work out one platform. Um, can you and so share the, the handle? Easiest. So, yeah, it's the it's Pemmican Project. Okay. I'm going to try and make sure it's Pemmican Project everywhere. I am technically also on YouTube for when I do my longer brain dumps. Um, that seems to work out better there. But in any case, any sort of engagement, sharing it really helps get the word out because it does seem like that's the like that really is just the key bottleneck uh, i'm very happy with how people respond to the product i'm going to keep making it of course uh, but yeah that's really the best way to support amazing awesome and can you share your website or where to buy these bars yes so uh store is just store.pemmicanproject.com um as i might already have mentioned if people don't really know if they'll like it which is a completely fair concern i'll happily send product for free they can either just message me on um 
my email, which is rasmus at pemmicanproject.com, or even easier, just reach out on Instagram. I get back to everyone, although in certain periods of time, my response time is a little longer because, uh, yeah, it is just me. But, uh, but those are the two easiest places to reach me. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time and for explaining us about the Pemmican Project. It's thank been you a so pleasure much for having to me. have you. Yeah, I'm really glad to join. Well,